Hi guys. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Just a quick disclaimer, I'm going to be talking about some very graphic things including violence and I might even be showing clips that include graphic descriptions of stuff and also maybe even some adult language. I'll try to limit it as much as I can but if I feel like it really pertains to the story I will include it. Hopefully we're all adults here. Today we're talking about The Grim Sleeper. So if you don't know The Grim Sleeper is a serial killer who was killing from the 80s all the way to the mid to late 2000s. So I was minding my business and I get an alert, which says a lot about me that I get these kind of alerts, but I got an alert that said that the Grim Sleeper was found dead in his cell. He was 67 years old and he was on death row in San Quentin State Prison. The statement reads, Franklin was found unresponsive in his cell on March 28th at about 7.20 p.m. Medical assistance was rendered and an ambulance was summoned. Franklin was pronounced deceased at 7.43 p.m. His cause of death is pending the results of an autopsy. However, there were no signs of trauma. So no signs of trauma. They're already trying to rule out, you know, some sort of attack or something that could be like a suicide or something like that. You know, he's 67. Could it be natural causes? Could it be the Rona? We don't know. But I will definitely keep you updated when the autopsy comes out. Just a quick fun fact. I actually know somebody who knew him. So back in the day, I used to live in LA. When I lived in LA, there was a girl that I knew and she actually was his neighbor. She lived in South Central LA and she was really close to him. So close that she would leave her kids with him and he would give her rides all the time. And the last ride that he gave her, she was pregnant. As we'll get into when I talk about his whole history, is he targeted a specific kind of woman. Let's discuss how Lonnie Franklin became the Grim Sleeper. Lonnie David Franklin Jr. was born in Los Angeles, California on August 30th, 1952, which makes him a Virgo. Now, I know a lot of you don't believe in this kind of stuff, but I'm a Virgo. And a lot of people have told me that uh, Virgos would make perfect serial killers because, well, you know, the attention to detail, the obsession, the criticism, the scathing judgment of others, you know, moving on. From now on, I'm going to be just referring to him as Lonnie. He was born the second of three children. He was a middle child, so he had what's known as the middle child syndrome. Lonnie completed 11 years of school, but he never received a degree. Lonnie enlisted in the army in the 70s, and he was an army cook and a private. He got stationed in Stuttgart, Germany. And in 1974, he was part of a very brutal attack. Around 12.30 a.m. on April 17, 1974, Lonnie and two other members of the U.S. Army stopped a woman. Her name was Ingrid W. We don't know her last name. She was a German teen. She was 17 years old and she was walking home from her boyfriend's house. Lonnie and the two other men in the Army were in a little Fiat. They pulled up on her as she was walking and they asked her for directions. After talking to her, they offered her a ride. She accepted. She says that as soon as she got in the car, they put a knife to her neck, they drove her out to a field, and they gang raped her. Furthermore, one of them, we believe it is Lonnie due to what we found out later about him, actually took a photograph of the brutal attack. Then they proceeded to drive her back and drop her off at the street. As they were driving to drop her off, she tried to coax them into giving her their number. She tried to feign interest to get a phone number. In her mind, she was trying to get some sort of evidence to maybe prosecute them in the future. The only person who took the bait was Lonnie. He believed that she was interested in him after getting gang raped, which is crazy. And he actually did give her his phone number. After she got dropped off, she went to the hospital. She filed a police report. She gave them the phone number and they were able to set him up. She called him. She said she wanted to meet him at a train station. 
She had the police with her surveillancing the situation. And as soon as he appeared, she dropped a handkerchief. That was the sign for the police to know that this was the person. They came out and they arrested him. Once they arrested him, they also got the other two that were involved and they prosecuted them and they were all sentenced to four years, which sounds, for me personally, it doesn't seem like enough time, but moving on. All three of the privates received a four year sentence, but this is the weird part. Less than a year into the sentence, Lonnie got a general discharge from the US Army. The weird thing is that a, he got a discharge, but B, he was the only one out of the three who got the discharge. The other two served the four years. We don't know why that is, and it's, it's just weird. According to a detective that would end up working on his case later on, he says, quote, he got caught and got away with it, and he came back here, meaning the U.S., and he started getting girls again. But as soon as they showed hesitation or gave him a hard time, he killed them. Any inkling of him getting caught or them treating him bad, he killed them. This is really important to note because, you know, he did this once with these other people in the 70s and he got caught. So he learned, I'm guessing, he learned you can't let him get away. If they get away, they're going to tell on you. If they tell on you, you're going to get caught. So if they show any sign of anything, so now we fast forward from 1974 and we're in the 80s in Los Angeles, specifically South Central LA. If you know anything about the 80s in South Central LA, you'll know that there was a crack epidemic going on. Lonnie really did not like crackheads or strawberries as he called them. He had a personal hate for any woman who smoked crack. Why you ask? I'll tell you because of his first wife. He had a very traumatic incident that happened. This is according to his friends. They said that he had been working and he gave his wife some money to pay the bills and he gave her the money, he went to work and when he came back from work, he found his wife with young gangbangers in the house and she was smoking crack and getting high and he like walked in on these men in his house and his wife getting high and it just, he was so disrespected, he was so enraged. And ever since that moment, he had this like irrational hate of crackheads, specifically black women crackheads who reminded him of his wife. Keep that in mind because those are going to be his targets when he becomes a serial killer. According to his friends, this is what set him off. Now, anybody who knew him knew of his hate for crackheads. He hated them so much that he just would talk about it all the time. Not only that, but if they were standing out in front of the house, just hanging out, and a crackhead would walk by, he would get so angry, he would go up to them and try to fight them. Sometimes he would grab them, sometimes he would attack them. It was just this irrational rage that he had towards these women. There was as I said earlier, a huge crack epidemic. This resulted in, of course, a lot of deaths, a lot of overdoses. So the LAPD had this term, NHI, no human involved. If they found a dead body that they assumed was a prostitute or a drug abuser and they were like dead, they would rule it as an NHI, no human involved, meaning due to their lifestyle and their drug use, they just died. They would close the investigation, they wouldn't look into it any further, and it would be done. Enter into the scene a woman by the name of Margaret Prescott. Here's her picture. Margaret Prescott was one of the first people to raise the alarm. Margaret Prescott formed something called the Black Women Count. These weren't NHI, no human involved overdoses. These are killings, and they're targeting black women who are discarded by society or not really checked on or worried about women who maybe have lost contact with their family women who are on drugs women who if they don't answer the phone or they go missing for days at a time nobody worries maybe nobody's even calling them to see what where they are or what's going on with them she launched this movement to pressure the lapd to investigate these killings as uh a murders as a possible serial killer and not just an overdose. A lot of these women victims of the Grim Sleeper were just ruled as Jane Doe's. I found an article from 1985. At the time, they had not called him the Grim Sleeper. His name was the Southside Slayer. 
And this article spoke about an investigation that determined that the crimes that were being committed were actually committed by a single person who was labeled the South Side Slayer. There's enough similarity in what we're finding to link them together. He said that the manner of death was similar and that all the victims had prostitution arrest records and apparently were picked up by a car while street walking, killed at other locations, and then driven to the area where they were found. Quote, you might say it's an overkill type of situation. Henderson also said that none of the women were found fully clothed, all were found in varying states of undress, and their ages ranged from 22 to 34. So, although the victims of the Grim, Grim Sleeper are, are way more than what has been reported, uh, especially when they raided his house and found a, a disturbing amount of photographs of women who look like they were either dead or passed out or something. The first known victim of the Grim Sleeper, and when I say known, I mean like known where the body is found and has been attributed to them, but keep in mind, the police, the people in the community, basically everybody agrees that he definitely had more victims than what he actually was convicted of. So Lonnie's first victim was 29-year-old Deborah Jackson. Her body was discovered on August 8th, 1985. She had been shot three times in the chest and dumped in an alleyway. In 1986, Lonnie married Sylvia Jackson, his second wife. He had two children. He was well liked in the community and he even had a job with the government. He was working as a sanitation worker with the city of Los Angeles. This is a major factor into why a lot of these bodies have not been found. This would also factor into how he was able to dispose of a lot of these bodies. It is believed that he dumped a lot of these bodies in garbage bins and landfills all over Los Angeles. In August 1986, 34-year-old Henrietta Watkins' body was found under a discarded mattress. The next year, three bodies were found. 23-year-old Barbara Ware and 26-year-olds Bernita Sparks and Mary Lowe. Their bodies were discovered and Sparks' body was discovered in a garbage can. In 1988, the bodies of 22-year-old Lucretia Jefferson and 18-year-old Alicia Monique Alexander were also found. All seven women were shot with a 25 caliber handgun. Remember that. And DNA from the same person was found on all of their breasts. Keep in mind, it's the 80s and DNA technology was in its infancy. So even though they were able to gather his DNA, they really weren't able to do much with it at the time. And here comes a very controversial point. One of the main points of controversy, one of the main issues here is that even when the police knew that there was a serial killer on the loose, they never actually went out and said that. They even had a task force called the 800 Task Force where they had composite sketch of the serial killer, they were collecting information about him, but they never actually went out and said, hey, if you live in South Central LA, be careful, there is a serial killer. There was no love lost between the community and the police, which already had a lot of racial tensions. We're talking the Watts riots, we're talking the Rodney King beating, and the riots that followed when those police officers were acquitted. There is so much tension between the community and the police. Hear me out. There's a few theories on why the LAPD did not notify the public. Now, if you know anything about LA, specifically South Central LA, and the LAPD, you'll know that <laughs> there's not a very hunky-dory relationship going on there. If you watch the documentary Tales of a Grim Sleeper, they really go into detail about the whole relationship between the community and the police and why this serial killer case was treated very differently than a lot of other serial cases that were going on at the same time. The victims themselves being prostitutes, um, made them vulnerable. You see, remember when I told you about my friend who knew him and who was his neighbor and who took rides with him? She wasn't a prostitute and she wasn't a drug user. She was African American and she was a young woman. But you see, the Grim Sleeper, he didn't target women he felt were upstanding citizens. He chose women that he knew 
the police didn't care about and maybe even the community didn't care about. And now we talk about the one that got away. On November 1988, 30-year-old Enitria Washington narrowly escaped the grim sleeper. She said she was walking to a friend's house when a man in an orange pinto with a racing stripe on it stopped her and asked her where she was going. She said she was going to a party and he said, well, can I come? And she kind of laughed it off and ignored him. He then offered her a ride. She brushed him off. After she refused his ride, he says, see, that's what's wrong with you black women. Nobody can be nice to you. She says she felt bad and she accepted the ride. She gets into the car with him. She says that almost immediately he pulls out a firearm and shoots her. She was shocked. She couldn't even realize what was going on. And when she did, she said, you shot me. Why did you shoot me? He replied and said, you disrespected me. And then he raped her and started taking pictures of her. She said that she had passed out during the rape and was awakened again by the flash of the Polaroid camera. When she woke up, she started fighting back. He opened the door and pushed her out and drove off, leaving her there to die. But she didn't die. She went, she found help, she survived. Not only did she survive, but she managed to give police a sketch. This is the sketch that I mentioned earlier. The bullet that was extracted from her matched the 25 caliber bullets that were in the other victims. So now we have a confirmation that there is a serial killer loose. We even have a sketch. We have a description of the vehicle, yet none of this information was made available to the public and particularly the community in which these crimes were occurring. Now here's where it gets really crazy. In 1989, the police thought they got a break. Spoiler alert, they didn't. LA County Sheriff's Deputy Ricky Ross, who was a narcotics officer, he was driving erratically and he got pulled over by the police. When the police pulled him over, they found him with a prostitute smoking crack. They searched his vehicle and they found a nine millimeter pistol. They then decided to do a ballistics test and they decided that he was the serial killer. But later on, the charges were dropped because apparently there was some faulty police work regarding the ballistics. Keep in mind, he had a nine millimeter, but the murder weapon is a 25 caliber. Even though he was exonerated from this crime, he was still fired by the LAPD, you know, because of the whole prostitute smoking crack thing. Ricky Ross ended up suing the LAPD and they ended up settling for an undisclosed amount. Three years later, Ricky Ross died. Here is where the name Grim Sleeper comes into play. After Ricky Ross was arrested, this is when the Grim Sleeper supposedly slept. Now there's two theories regarding this Grim Sleeper sleeping thing. The first theory, which is what most people talk about, is that he never in fact actually slept. It's just that he figured out a way to kill and dispose of the bodies, you know, because he's a sanitation worker who drives a garbage truck. He can kind of dispose of these bodies in a way that nobody can find them. My theory, and hear me out here, I think that when the police officer Ricky Ross was arrested, Lonnie was probably really happy, like, oh my God, they think a cop did it. Maybe if I stop killing at the same time that he gets arrested and dies afterwards, people will really believe that he's the one who did it. Because if the killings continue after he's arrested and, or after he dies, then that really exonerates the detective Ricky Ross. But if the killings stop, a lot of people are gonna start to think maybe he did it. That's just my theory. And who am I? I'm just a girl with way too much time on her hands and not enough friends. Fast forward to 2002. The Grim Sleeper awakens. In March 2002, 15-year-old Princess Bertholomew, I'm so sorry if I'm saying it incorrectly, whose body was found dead. She had been strangled, badly beaten, and thrown in an alleyway, but she was not shot. Again, a year later, in July 2003, the body of 35-year-old Valerie McCorvey was found dead in the same manner as 15-year-old Princess's body was found. Both of these victims were dumped in the alleyways of South Central Los Angeles. If you look at a map 
of where the bodies of all the victims were found. In comparison to where Lonnie's house is, it's startling. They are so close to his house. Everybody says he knew those streets, he knew those alleyways like the back of his hand. He was a sanitation worker in that area. Furthermore, he was super outgoing. He was always out and about. The house he lived in, which was the scene of so many crimes, was actually his parents' house and his grandparents' house before that. So it had a lot of history and he had a lot of roots in his community. He was very well known and really got along with everyone. He didn't fit the typical serial killer profile of, you know, he kept to himself, he didn't speak much, the windows were always drawn, everything was always secretive. He was not that type of person at all. He was so outgoing and he was always out in the neighborhood talking to people that when I was searching for a picture of his house, I stumbled upon a Google Maps image that was taken of his house and he was right out there talking to somebody on a bicycle. That's how outgoing he was. Once these bodies were found, the search for the Grim Sleeper resumed. Now we're in the 2000s and DNA testing has come so far from where it was in the 80s. It's 2008 and now we have a major break in the case. At this time, there was a system going on where when people got arrested, especially for felonies, they would get their DNA taken. Christopher Franklin, Lonnie's son, got arrested in 2008 and his DNA was taken. His DNA was cross-referenced with unsolved crimes DNA samples. This is where the whole familial DNA controversy comes into play. Some people believe that this was a violation of human rights, that this was a privacy violation, and on and on and on. When they cross-referenced Christopher Franklin's DNA, it hit with all the Grim Sleeper victims and the DNA that was collected from them. But it wasn't an exact match. The DNA analyst determined that the person who was the Grim Sleeper was either Christopher's father or uncle. And so they began surveillance. This is the time at which the police also released a 1987 911 call, which they believe the person who made this 911 call was the Grim Sleeper himself. And I'll insert the 911 call here. Detectives have this phone call recording from 1987. Central. I'd like to see the police station report. Yes, I'd like to report a, a, a murder or a dead body or something. Where at? The address is 1346 East 56th Street in the alley. You know, he like, he threw her out. The only thing is hanging out of this, like he threw a gas tank on top of her and, uh, and the only thing you can see out is her feet. I'll get what you mean. Huh? What's your name? Oh, I was standing on this. I know too many people. Okay then, bye-bye. All right. The caller spotted the killer and told police he saw him dump Barbara Ware's body in this alleyway from this blue van. He even named the license plate. 1PZP746. Well, it means a great deal to me. It means that uh, they're not just sitting on it now as they did before. Uh, it, it means that the community is becoming more aware of it. His victims were almost exclusively women. An L.A. police detective say he last struck in January of 2007. If you have any information leading to the Grim Sleeper's arrest, please give the Los Angeles Police Department a phone call. Now this is really crazy. This is straight out of a movie. During their surveillance, they have footage of Lonnie at a birthday party at a pizza parlor. Anyway, and I'll insert the surveillance footage here. They saw that Lonnie was at a birthday party at the pizza parlor. What they ended up doing was that one of the investigators posed as a busboy at the pizza parlor and took his pizza and the cup he was drinking with and all the other items that he used to eat that would have his DNA. They then took those items and had them tested at a lab, which they came back positive for the Grim Sleeper. Lab results confirmed that Lonnie David Franklin Jr. was the grim sleeper and he was arrested at his home in July of 2010. Thank you for taking my questions early for the final call newspaper. Appreciate what you said about the community involvement as well as the family. Is it possible to hear a bit from Margaret Prescott and the work of the family in terms of how they passed out flyers? Or just can you also, as she does, address their role in that? Sure, you know, I'll, I'll uh, 
what I'll say is that, is that the families have been absolutely instrumental. Uh, Ms. Prescott has been instrumental. They have, first of all, they give the detectives motivation. You know, this, these are long, drawn out, tedious investigations in which you can lose hope. But that hope is renewed by the family. That hope is renewed by a community that supports this department. Handing out flyers, making sure that, uh, that the uh, council reward was widely publicized, making sure that people saw these victims as, as human beings with faces and lives and not as, uh, as something other than that. So it's very important. Can we talk to Detective Kilcoyne? Can I just add to that? I'm, I'm Margaret Prescott, founder of the Black Coalition Fighting Back Serial Murders. For us, it's been since 1985. I have a file here of documents going back to 1985 that were mimeographed. It's a very emotional uh, time for us. Detective Kilcoyne, I'm not going to get up here and attack you. I know that we've been critical, and uh, if we have our man, I'd like to congratulate Detective Kilcone and all those who made it possible, and also uh, the family members who have stuck with us, who have come out, and the vigils, and handing out flyers, etc. Somebody asked about if there were more victims out there. Many of you know that there have been three sets of murders, the Southside Slaying, the Strawberry Murders, and now this Grim Sleeper. We know that there's still victims out there, Detective Kilcone. I want to make an appeal to the chief and all of the officials here that this task force keep going because we've seen hopefully some justice in this case, but we know that there are other victims out there, there are other families out there suffering. Finally, I want to say to the press and also any officials, please stop referring to these victims as prostitutes. Yes. They were yes. women, yes. they were mothers, they were loved by their families and their communities. Imagine a young child turning on the television and hearing their mothers being maligned in this way. So please treat them with that kind of respect, the same respect that that young woman who got killed in Aruba got, these women who are black from South LA deserve the same kind of respect. So I'd like every, to thank everybody for bringing some Franklin stood trial and he, he didn't stand a chance. Well, your DNA was identified in relation to this young lady's death. Okay. No, I'm just saying, I, you, that's what you're telling me, so that's all I can, yeah, that's all I can say. Okay, in 2003, this young lady was found killed. Have you ever seen her? No, I haven't. Okay, 2002, this young lady was found. Do you recognize her? No, I don't. Princess. This young lady here, her name is Bernita Sparks. Wow, she looked heavy set. <laughs> Why? No, I just said she looked fat. Hmm. Uh, no, I don't know. This young lady, her name is Henrietta Wright. Go ahead, take a close look. No recollection, or you just don't. I don't know her. I don't know her. But ugly, I don't know her. So what? <laughs> but ugly, I don't know her. Mm. Mm. Sorry, I don't know her. I mean, all of these people that you say you don't know through scientific evidence are all pointing the finger at Lonnie David Franklin Jr. Sit there and look at their faces, all staring at you, pointing that finger at you. Don't insult my intelligence. Please insult don't insult. I'm, I'm gray-haired. I'm going bald. I'm getting close to the end here. Give me an explanation. I have no explanation to do. give you for something I didn't do. Mr. Franklin, you have a major problem. You creep out. You pick up these young ladies uh, that are out working Western or Figaro or whatever in the middle of the night. You have sex with them. You kill them. And then you dump their bodies in alleys throughout the city of Los Angeles. Most of them near, not too far from your house. It's like a dog pissing on a fire hydrant. That's you. You're leaving your mark every single time you do this. The science has caught up with you. you there's no getting out of it. 
You know what the news calls you? You tell me what the news calls you. Well, I know damn well you know. I mean, you watch the news at night. You watch TV I on occasion. I talk about some guy on the news. But what do they call him? What was it? The uh, Reaper? The what? The Reaper? Grand Reaper? Something like that. The Grim Sleeper. Oh, okay. I know it was something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, saw it on, I saw it on TV. I look at TV. Well, of course you do. Yeah, I got TV in every room. Well, I there you go. All right. There yeah, it is. And I'm so, sure and here we are, sitting things. here. Paul and Dennis are sitting here having a chat with the Grim Sleeper. And that is Mr. Lonnie David Franklin Jr. It's not me, my man. Sorry, it's not me. One of these gals has uh, survived. And she's going to have a she's going to have a grand time sitting in a courtroom looking looking down at a man that that uh, did her some her terrible terrible, <laughs> terrible things years ago. You're done. The life as Lonnie Franklin knew it is over. You've gone to your last pizza party uh, down in Buena Park. You've trolled Western Avenue for the last time. You've seen fireworks for the last time. I just have to get an attorney because I didn't know none of these people. So it's simple as that. I have to get an attorney. All right. I don't know what else to say. Uh, it's all going through his head right now, man. He's just looking at his future, thinking of his past and what has he done. Yeah, let me talk to you outside. He was found guilty of several counts of murder, and he was sentenced to death. It is the judgment and sentence of this court that you shall suffer the death penalty. In the murder of Henrietta Wright, the, the additional two years is imposed uh, pursuant to the firearm enhancement of 12022.5. You shall then and there be put to death. The total non-death sentence is life plus 25 years to life plus 14 years all of that uh, consecutive. Of course, as you guys know, I will most definitely be updating you when the autopsy results come out and any other information relating to this case. You should really watch the documentary Tales of a Grim Sleeper. It's on Amazon Prime. I highly recommend you watch it. It goes into so much detail about a lot of the more gruesome aspects of the case. I just feel for the victims and I and I hate that I refer to them as prostitutes, crackheads. They are more than that. And then that's just something that I really want to say. I don't mean it in a disrespectful way. At the end of the day, every single one of us is somebody's child and none of us are perfect. So I'll just leave it at that. If there are any other cases that you would like me to look into, please let me know in the comments down below. I've already got a list going, but I would love to hear who you guys are interested in. I'll see you in the next video. I've got my eye on you.